Shalom Hevra. I'm here with Professor Chaim Seiman, who's a scholar of Jewish law, insurance law, and private law, and has recently published Halacha, the Rabbinic Idea of Law, with Princeton University Press. Seiman sits as a rabbinic, rabbinical court judge at Dayan with the Beit Din of America, and serves as an expert witness in insurance law and Jewish law in federal court, and serves as a professor of law at Villanova Law School. Professor Seiman, thank you for taking time to talk. Sure, great to be here. So, um, to jump in uh, on this discussion about, about your book, which has created a lot of conversation, uh, important conversation, I want to start with a God question that many of us, um, as in our, in our practice of, of Jewish life, don't relate to halacha uh, merely as law, but we think of it as a vehicle of connection to Kodesh Baruch Hu, right, as a way of, of connecting to God, uh, that it is a practice, it's a spiritual practice. And so I wonder, how does that notion of halacha being a vehicle towards relationship to God uh, affect how we interpret the law? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. And as you said, halacha is sort of, when we, well, let's put this, when we say law, we sometimes think of like the floor, the baseline, the minimum. When we think of like spiritual growth, connecting to God, we think of like reaching for the heavens, the maximum. Right. And I think one question that many systems have, but I think are particularly true in halacha, is sort of like understanding how these two things work, work together, especially since they're not always kept separate. So let me give you an example. I was actually just learning this with my kids um, on Shabbos, and it, and, it, and, it, and it came up. So the, the Mishnah in the, um, the first Mishnah in the fifth parak of Brachot, um, this, so the fifth parak of Brachot is largely about davening Shmonesrei. And the Mishnah says, COVID Rosh, right? You should only start davening sort of in a, in a serious or a, a pious state of mind or a reverent state of mind or something like that. And then uh, it says, Chasidim Arishonim Ayushom The early pious ones would wait a whole hour. So that their, their hearts are, are pointed towards God. And then the Mishnah says, Afidu HaMelech Shol Bishlomo. Even if the king is sort of greeting you in the middle of davening, you shouldn't stop. And even if a snake is, uh, is, is, is wrapping itself around your ankles, you shouldn't pause. So my kids looked at me like, really? Are you crazy? A snake? I mean, they don't know what kings are exactly, or, you know, that's, but like, you know, really? And, um, I said, you know, that's a really good point, right? So like, what is this Mishnah doing? So I then, particularly with the older one, looked in the Gemara, and the Gemara tells a couple of stories, a story of this guy who, who did not respond uh, when the king um, or, or the army officer uh, challenged him. And the army officer says, what are you, crazy? I could have killed you and I would have been in my rights. And it tells another story about Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, who, who there was this, this animal, some kind of snake that was, bothering everybody and bit people and the people died. And Rabbi Hanin ben Dosa said, you know, uh, show me his, where he lives. And he goes and he puts his heel over the hole of the thing and, and, the, uh, and the snake bites and the snake dies. And then he brings the snake or the ar as they call it, um, to the Beit Midrash and he says, hey, look, it's not the snake that kills, it's sin that kills. And I said, look, the Gemara tells these stories. I said, but, but let's look at this Mishnah. Who is it talking about? And they said, well, Hasidim Harishonim. I mean, does that sound like everybody? And then we looked at the Riff and the Rambam and the Rush, who don't quote those stories. Um, they don't quote those, and those stories don't wind up in the bottom line form of halacha. And to me, this was, it's really what you're asking. So, so I was like trying to explain to my kids, like, here's what's going on. The mission is doing two things here. It's telling you the baseline rules, right? You, you shouldn't interrupt during davening unless you've got a really good excuse, right? That's the part that winds up in the Shulchan Aruch. These stories there give flavor of, of, you know, heights that maybe we could reach or aspire to, but, but they're not the baseline rules for everybody. Clearly not. That's why when I was trying to explain to my daughter, she's 14, that I said, what's important about the riff is what he leaves out. And she's like, what does that mean? That sounds weird. I said, look, he left out those stories. Why did he leave out those stories? And we engaged in a, uh, a discussion about this. So to me, like this mission, and I'm picking on it, right? So, so, so it's trying to both educate you towards the proper ideal, 
but also then the way it gets processed through halacha also tell you what the minimum. So of course, by the time you look in the Mishnah Bur or something like that, it says, yeah, of course, if you think the snake's going to endanger your life, you move. And there's the machlok at whether the afseek, pause in this Mishnah, means, means moving or stopping to pray, right? And then there's other parts in the Gemara that make it clear that, yes, anytime your life is in danger or might be in danger, of course you stop that. But, so that's what we might think of as the law, the baseline rule. But it includes this to say, look, I don't think every, you know, I don't think we should run around putting our, our, our feet over snake pits to test them. But you should understand that at some level, that's a principle too. That's a kind of idea worth aspiring to as well. Maybe this is how davening should be taken. Now, what I say in the book about this is Chazal did not have a police force. They didn't have a state. They didn't have, right? their sole enforcement mechanism, so to speak, was their ability to draw you in with their words and their ideas. And therefore, I think they use those and these stories, these things, as, as doing that work precisely because halacha, at least, you know, in, in the reality of Gullus, but that really includes the time in the Gemara for these purposes, doesn't have any other method of enforcement other than its rhetoric devices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Now, the challenge is, yeah. the challenge is, of course, and is that, um, Sometimes we like law precisely because it's clear. It tells you exactly its rules and parameters. And we save these other sorts of things. Like if we think about our culture, and by our, I mean, you know, any you know, modern culture, you know, tends to say law should be narrow and what we're willing to enforce via the state and via police and via the courts. And, and these other things we call them ethics, morals, religion, whatever you want to, Right. Those should float in the culture, but should be kept separate so as to not confuse these two. To me, one of the interesting things, which is both, like most things in life, a pro and a con, is that it does mix these two. And there's a lot of like ambiguity and uncertainty of when you're in which mode. Great. So picking up on that point exactly, actually, um, I wonder if we sell halacha short by calling it law. Because um, when we look at other legal systems, it might have a purity in terms of its, uh, how it operates. But here, I think we're really dealing with lots of genres. We're dealing with ethics, we're dealing with theology, we're dealing with ritual, we're dealing with politics. Um, you know, and um, I wonder, like, is, is law the right translation for halacha? Yeah, so that's, a, that's also uh, an important question. So here's my thought about this. I think that there, there's, there's an obvious way in which the word law doesn't fit. A little bit what we just talked about, but, but you know, like I write in the book, um, can you imagine, if you think of, uh, of, of, of uh, Daf Yomi, right? Can you, ima which, can you imagine that if we said, hey, in America, I don't know, a whole bunch of people read a page of the federal bankruptcy code every day and they're not bankruptcy lawyers? Right, you would say that's insane, right? Can you imagine you go to a wedding of our mitzvah and somebody says, you know, in restatement of contract section 23.2, it says this. In the restatement of torts, it says this. Ah, right, this would mean so many of the things we do, right? I, I promise you, if you look at, if you do a review of every fourth grade curriculum in the country, you will not find that the laws of bailments, which is what we call shomrim, are, are feature heavily in the fourth and fifth grade curriculums uh, in America or in Sweden or, or anywhere else. So in all those ways, if you think about the things we do with Torah study and you know, halacha sort of by extension, a lot of them make no sense uh, in the box of law. On the other hand, I think that um, some have tried to say that, well, law is, is, is totally the wrong box. I think that goes too far in the other way. I think that you can't get away that there's a, there's a fundamental legal normativity here that's different from even like a moral normativity, a sort of certain concreteness and particularity in the way the texts are structured and how they see themselves, how they talk themselves, that simply converting it into philosophy, theology, I think misses something important about how Chazal view the world, that they think that the law is the language, at least, to start these conversations, even if it's doing a lot more and becomes a lot broader. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So halacha as a, as a progressive versus a conservative force, and by here I don't mean political terms, I sort of mean progressive, evolving to the moment, responsive to the context, 
quick to e uh, evolve versus um, a non-evolving system that says um, the, the context is only one piece here and the sustainability, the, the continuity uh, is, what, is, what matters more, is what matters more. What force do you see more dominant within the, um, within the system at large? And of course, there's different eras. Uh, there's different eras to that. There's different eras, there's different people. So I, here's what I think. I think that the reflex you'll get from most people um, is that halacha is a very conservative force. And there, there's a, obviously very good reasons for that. Um, it very much takes its internal texts and ideas seriously, and it, and it doesn't break with them uh, very quickly. So that's, that's the sort of obvious answer. It's obviously true. It's certainly the place to start. But let, let's, if, you, if you think about um, really the events of the past few months, in terms of, let's say, closing down communities, closing down shuls, um, and, and not just shuls, but sort of like, you know, communal life. Uh, I think that halachists, at least some of them, were of the quickest to respond to um, the COVID um, challenges. I'm talking back in March. Um, if you think of a lot of things that came out around Pesach and, you know, so, so, you know, in some ways it very much took the context into account. And, and you know, I think that, that, you know, again, it's hard to know because this is in New York, which was in the epicenter, but I think things coming out of the Orthodox, modern Orthodox community were not only ahead of other Jewish communities, but were just ahead of like the general world. Now, now that doesn't mean, now, so I think what happens is as follows. I think communities and the rabbis have this like idea and this image of what does it take to remain rooted? In, in the tradition, in what, how they understand, you know, the halachic life, the from life, the life in the derech Hashem and the path of God. And I think in that way, it's very conservative. But I think if their sense of maintaining that requires very quick and maybe even radical changes, as I think that COVID is a very good example of that, they will be very, very quick to move. Um, so you know, on that point, it's almost like there's an evolutionary psychology that's built in here around where's the threat? Like when the threat is around gender issues or sexuality issues, got to be very conservative. When the threat is something else around our survival, got to be kind of very reactive. So I wonder, yeah. like, if and I, I would say, I would say to, to 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 inject a drop of politics here in in the following way. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's no secret that many of these rabbis, at least, lean and their communities for sure lean politically quite conservative and are generally, you know, in broad strokes, fans of of that. And yet, and yet, when it came to this to this issue, they were totally willing to buck that trend of the no masks and the skepticism over the virus and all sorts of things. And I think the reason for that is is what you said is that this was not processed as a political question. This was provided as a communal survival question. And then you know, just able to shut all that out. And I know you know, not for lack of internal communal pressure to kind of fit in with where maybe naturally the, the political alliances uh, lie. You know, yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think if you read the press, if you're, if you're not a part of the, of the Orthodox community, you read the press, you think the Orthodox community botched this whole thing. Because the press keeps keep showing how, um, how non-responsive the community was. But, but, I, but I think you're right, the deeper story there was, was a responsive nature to it. So I, I, I often translate halacha, and, and I think you'll think this is going too far, I, I often translate the word halacha as progress, walking forward. It's actually about moving us forward into this next era. But, you know, but there's a lot more to say there. So let me ask something else. You know, one of the top 10 mantras in yeshiva, along with, you know, you don't want to marry your chavrusa. Remember that one? Which means uh, when you're dating someone, you're not looking for someone who can learn a shach and taz with you. You want a lifestyle, you know? <laughs> Another one is Torah is about obligations, not rights. Obligations, not rights which is another way of kind of like rebuking liberal secular society, which it talks about human rights and entitlements and the like. But I wonder like, what is the relationship to, how do you understand the relationship to rights within, within halacha? I mean, obviously it is built around a, a language of obligations, but how do you understand this notion that, um, uh, of women's rights or of, of the rights of those who are struggling in poverty to tzedakah? And like, it's a huge question, but just a, maybe a brief reflection on this. So I, I would say first, uh, I think your premise is correct, and and many have noticed this. I think the most eloquent articulation comes, not surprisingly, from Robert Cover, who was a law professor at Yale, who died, you know, in his forties a, a bunch of years ago. But he wrote a very short but very penetrating article on this question. He says, "Look, 
the language of halacha, it's not that the word right doesn't exist. You call it schus, the achron in particular, like talking about schus atayna and things like that. But it is certainly not an animating ideal. Um, as opposed to in the, uh, at least some versions of the Anglo-American tradition and where rights uh, play a much more dominant role. I think that's, certainly that's the first move you want to make and that's right. When we talk about rights, I, the, next, the question I ask is against who? A right is against somebody. So rights against who? Um, you know, so we think about rights against the state, rights against a counterparty, uh, rights against, so, so that, that, so, you know, in halacha, um, certain times, like you said, the poor have rights to, like at chikachapeya, things like that, right? That is, that is quite clear. Sometimes, um, you know, the other way, we talk about matnot kahuna, we say that no particular Kohen has a right to this. It's, it's the owner's right to distribute it, right? So those things get, um, get, dis get worked at differently. In terms of like a right against the state, um, I think that is weaker sourced um, in, in halacha. And, um, you know, I think Cover made this point himself. I think his argument was, and I think he took two, one which you mentioned. So he said, if you want to think about a right, and, um, and he compared, and again, this was like in the late 80s or, ni or very early 90s, so a while ago, but, but the, the issues were there. Um, education and what we'd call, you know, women's or egalitarianism. Um, so he said, the question of that the community is obligated to educate its kids um, is a much easier move to make in halacha than in secular law when you say I have a right to education because who's that, that right to and who's paying for that? Kalach uh, le the opposite, when, when he talked about, you know, the, 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 the claim of that a woman may make, I have a right to do X in, in shul or wherever it is, is a, is a language that, that is much more it is a move that's much easier to make in the American law tradition uh, than the halakhic tradition. And, and he says, and others have then, I think, talked about this, whether you're influenced by him or not, that, you, you know, the way you would do that is, is like, you know, for sukkah or ma, or things like that, we say women have obligated themselves. Um, that's, that's the way it has traditionally worked. Obviously, it doesn't answer all the questions. Yeah, not only to, to make sure the job gets done, but you also might say there's a virtue ethic involved. We're concerned in the person fulfilling duties. Um, and cultivating a certain character in that. I mean, I mean, that's, that's just myself. Okay, last question for you today. I could talk to you for hours. So the Medina, Medina Yisrael. So Baruch Hashem, we have a state. And wow, what a, what a dream. We can now like actualize halacha. The, the Torah dream of now the Jewish people have a state to be in control of halacha for all the people. Oh, but we got a problem. Most, the high majority of Israeli citizens, Jewish citizens, um, uh, you know, obviously Arab citizens, but Jewish citizens don't want halacha. They don't want halacha. So what do we do? So what do we do? And so one approach is, I don't care if they want it. Halacha needs to be the guiding force of the state. The other extreme is, no, nope, no halacha in any way a part of the secular state. And then there could be some middle ground of, okay, maybe halacha gets control of this and not control of this. Maybe, they're in con maybe there's a rab in it and they're in control of things like conversions and of weddings and the like. And I wonder where you fall out. Should we take a persuasion, not legislation approach? Or should there be some realms where we have this, our, our Jewish sovereignty, that there should be halacha guiding the state and in control of the state? Sure. So um, I think, you know, you're framing the questions right. You know, there's, there is a certain irony here is that we Jews have been davening hashiva shoftenu kavarishona uh, for, for, you know, I guess since since even before the same second base on this was built, or maybe right around that time, or anyway, for a very very long time, um, and you know, and um, and and for for so much of Jewish history, that was basically a pipe dream. Um, so so working out like the what does that actually mean was never never very important. Um, and then you know, all of a sudden, or maybe not all of a sudden, but whatever, through 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 uh, through uh, the process you know, the combination of the divine and the human process that leads to the Medina, here we have it. And it turns out that we don't know what to do exactly. Um, you know, um, now in my book, I take the view that while of course the question of, you know, whatever you can argue about the percentages, but, but that some percentages, of the, large percentages of the citizens do not want halakha is important. I try to say, let's even go be behind that. Right, let's like put that to the side for a minute. And like, does halakha as it 
emerged from its dullest context, does it have the tools to do it, even if you had a kind of willing population? And I am somewhat skeptical of that because I think in large part, some of the things we talked about up front, um, in, a, in a religious system, you can mix what we might call aspirational norms and regulatory norms together, right? Like in our mission about how to daven Shmonestra and when the snake is coming to you. A legal system, or at least a modern legal system, needs to like live on distinguishing those because I need to know when is a state gonna enforce this against me and what is like a amidas chasidis, a good thing to do, something like that. Um, because I think that halacha is sort of shot through with these mixtures, I think you can't really start talking about it unless you start separating it out. So that's kind of one question. That's, an, and that's what I would say. This is an internal halacha question. This is, even if, if our imagined community is all, you know, Yirei Hashem, who accept the sovereignty of halacha. Uh, the second point is, is that, you know, there, it, it, certain parts of, you know, I always take the, the, the my example is the two Shabbats, the Shabbat, you know, Shabbos and Shabbat Haaretz. If we think about the laws of Shabbat in time, you know, the seventh day of the week, they have evolved and, 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 and dealt with new realities and new technologies. And I think they're at a place where most people who keep Shabbat pretty much think they're in the right place. They will argue on the details here and there. And I, you know, I wrote an article for Mosaic um, about the Zoom Seder, which really got into Shabbat and technology questions. And it's pretty interesting that from like way to the you know, Orthodox right, all the way to like pretty much anyone who keeps Shabbat in any sense, everyone knows that you know, more or less where the boundaries are. And there's a fair amount of consensus for them. So if you recall when a couple of years ago, the Shabbos switch um, came out. So wall to wall, everyone says, this is a very bad idea. <laughs> it will kill Shabbos. Right? When else do you have, you know, uh, you know, Hadar, YCT, and Satmar all saying yes, it's a very bad idea. Um, so, so I think that it's evolved to a place where we kind of have a sense of what Shabbos should look like as a lived experience. Now, of course, there's, there's, there's arguments on the margins. If we take Shabbat to Aretz, Shemitah, we're in a very different place. Right? I think no one has any idea what it's supposed to look like. So what it's become is just like another form of kashras, right? So on, on the seventh and the eighth year, right? So then I'm mocked for this, huh? but, but the social vision, the, the moral vision, even the lived experience vision of what Shemitah is, I think nobody really has any idea. And, and I think wherever you are, I don't think anyone's satisfied with what we've come up with. No one thinks that. So I think a lot of the, the things that have to do with like the public administration of a state fall more into that Shemitah, um, Shemitah model than the Shabbos model, right? So I think the things that have not surprised me, things that have been practiced by Jews for centuries have found their, not everything, right? But, but a lot of them have found their stasis points. Some are obviously contentious, like you mentioned, mentioned with gender issues, but some are not. Shabbos, kosher, you know, okay, you, know, you run organizations trying to push some of the boundaries of kosher, but, but there's like a sense of what this is supposed to be. Um, and I think, I think things with like, you know, the public sphere, public, I think, I think they really aren't well developed for some of these reasons. So I think the first thing you need to do is to sort of like lay out some ground rules of what this ought to look like even before. And of course, it then intersects with the fact that people don't want it. My view, which I write in the book, is that, um, you know, I think the state should be facilitative and encouraging of Judaism, of halacha, um, but, but I think that it works much better at the cultural sphere um, than at the legal sphere. You know, what happens now, as you know, is that the only part that's really governed by halacha in the narrow sense of the term is, is the rabbinut, is marriage, divorce, and personal status. And not shockingly, uh, these are the places that create the most friction. Um, as Rav Amital, um, Zechitzal Gavracha would say, right, there's no law saying you can't drive on Yom Kippur in Israel. And yet, everybody knows that, uh, that you don't drive on Yom Kippur. And I think he said, I might be misquoting, so if this is wrong, uh, but I, I think I certainly heard from him a clip that like, if you want to make sure people drive on Yom Kippur, pass a law that they shouldn't drive in Yom Kippur. Um, 
so, so you know, there is clearly something going on in Israel, a sort of uh, re-Judaization or sort of the way Zionism is sort of morphing away from its sort of, you know, secularist, um, labor Zionist roots to something that is more Jewish. Not strictly halachic, though not anti-halachic. And I would sort of let that happen and not try to ruin it with law. Beautiful. No, very well said. Thank you. I could, I could listen to you for hours. Professor Chaim Seyman, check out his book, Hal Halacha, The Rabbinic Idea of Law with Princeton University Press. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much.